So I'm going to talk about how we monitor melanoma. So this is mostly about stage three, high risk stage two. I'll touch a bit upon how, how we might monitor people differently uh, in the future on treatment for stage four in particular. Um, so this is about liquid biopsies, which is a term that's being increasingly bandied about. We'll have liquid biopsies with everything in the oncology world now. Um, I don't know whether it's something that you're aware of. I mean, hands up if you've come across that term, please. Not many. Okay. So, so this is the next big thing in oncology, at least until it doesn't work, and then it'll be the last big thing in oncology. <laughs> so... How do we monitor melanoma at the moment? Well, we assess risk, and you'll be familiar with that, and I don't want to, s to steal Rebecca Matin's thunder tomorrow when she talks about how we assess risk, but looking at the depth of the tumour, nodal involvement, and so forth. Uh, and essentially, that allows us to, to tell you what we think the chances are that the surgeon's dealt with the melanoma or not. Uh, and then every year, uh, just in case people are getting used to it and comfy with it, we change the rules for assessing risk, uh, so that only we understand them. Um, uh, and this is called the AJCC criteria, uh, and they're changed every so often. Uh, one year, actually, a drug company who no longer exists produced a, a slide rule, which tells you how long ago it was, for assessing risk, um, and uh, gave me about a dozen. The surgeons all stole them um, within about a week, uh, but still didn't use them for some reason, so... I don't know what that was about. Anyway, we talk to you about that risk. Uh, and then, because at the moment, by and large, we're not using treatment in the adjuvant setting, although Matthew's going to explain that uh, in, in his talk, uh, we agree a schedule of clinic visits and scans about how we're going to keep an eye on you uh, episodically, check your skin, look for other melanomas, other skin lesions, check for your melanoma coming back and so forth, and then sort out a safety net because no melanoma is going to behave according to our pattern of clinic visits, and if trouble's going to come up, it's probably going to crop up in between visits. And all of this is desperately unsatisfactory uh, because the, the risk is something that, that's there all the time. It's not episodic, uh, and it, it bases everything around hospitals, which are usually difficult to get to, difficult to park at. So the question is, well, how can we do better? And one of the ways we can do better is to assess the risk much better in the first place, but that ultimately is not hugely helpful. So you've heard a bit about biomarkers this afternoon uh, and how better biomarkers will allow us to assess the risk better, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that, but ultimately it won't answer the fundamental question, which is what's going to happen to me? We don't have biomarkers that say no risk yet. So that means we're not in a good position to say, I've done a blood test, surgeon's cured you, off you go, you're not a patient anymore, um, which would be terrific, and maybe we'll get there one day, but at the moment we're not. The other thing we have to recognise is that as oncologists, a good proportion of our business comes from people who've been told they've got a very low risk after their melanoma's been chopped out. So we see people before they get stage four melanoma, if they've got a high risk, but a lot of the stage four people were told there's a 19 in 20 chance of being cured. But because there's so many of them, they're quite a, quite a large proportion of the people whom we end up seeing. So what we really need are a couple of things. Better tests during the course of monitoring that allow us to do that ideally at home, but if not, then repeatedly uh, at hospital rather than episodically. And then obviously better things that we can do at the point of risk. Because one of the reasons why this intermittent model of checking up on people and scanning from time to time has persisted is that until about 10 years ago, it didn't really matter when you picked up the melanoma because the, the treatment and the outcomes from that wasn't hugely different if you caught it early or late. It was the fact that it happened that drove what, what developed subsequently. But all that's changing. Um, and so to talk to the first point uh, about refining that assessment of risk and doing better, well, many of you will know about the Avast-M study, which was a negative trial comparing doing nothing, observation with bevacizumab for a year in people with high-risk melanoma. Um, there's the AJCC staging I talked about. Um, and 
one of the things that we've done from that is to look at the tumors of people who went in, into the trial. And we've done that in Oxford. We've done that in collaboration with Genentech, who are the, the, the company uh, known as Roche over on this side of the pond who, who make Bevacizumab. So we looked at about half the tumors uh, from patients in the study and looked just at the BRAF and NRAS mutations uh, that uh, drive some of those tumors. And as we expected, just under half had a BRAF mutation. Uh, and then if we looked at those patients who didn't, then about 20% uh, had a mutation um, in NRAS overall. And so here's one of the first refinements of risk that you can do. So this is a, a, a bunch of people who've got a high risk of melanoma coming back in a way that will kill them. So this is people dying as these curves come down. And having the BRAF mutation, or having the NRAS mutation, made that more likely than if you had neither mutation in this trial. And this is in the observation arms. So there's absolutely no chance that treatment had an impact upon this. So it's just adding another layer on to uh, our assessment of risk. The problem is, in terms of clinical decision making, when we sit down with you and say, well, what, what are we going to do now? Although this is statistically significant um, and important. Um, actually, it's not statistically significant. It's the, it's the other graph that is. Ignore that. But even if it were statistically significant, it wouldn't be hugely helpful because what it might say is, well, OK, we thought your risk was, was somewhere around here. But because you haven't got the mutation, it's around here. So we've turned 60% into 70% uh, that, that you're going to be alive in six years' time. Well, you can't do anything with that. You can't really say, OK, well, I, I, I don't need follow-up. I don't need to come back to the clinic. I don't need to worry about this or that. So, and, and this is why I think there's a certain futility in trying to refine that risk better and better and better. I mean, I guess if we could get it, it's 99% likely that you're cured of your melanoma. Well, it's 99% likely that I won't die of colorectal cancer in the next 10 years. It's probably not, actually. It's probably slightly less than that, but I don't get followed up by the colorectal oncologist. So you could start to have a conversation about how that level of risk is of the order of the general population who don't get to see oncologists. Um, but there are other ways of doing it. So Christian very kindly explained the difference between DNA and RNA. So there's the, there's the, um, the, the whole cookbook. There's the recipe sheet. So if we look at the recipe sheet in the tumor, we were also able to, to, to look and this is in the other arm of the trial, the people who had bevacizumab, very different outcomes for people according to what their recipe um, book in their cancer was. But again, even with these really big differences, so hazard ratio of 0.5, half the risk of your melanoma coming back if you're in one category compared with another, it's still, no, it's still not no risk. You know, there is no line going all the way across the top there that says, you're fine, off you go. So although there's a lot of work looking at this, and obviously it is the ideal, doing a test at the point you have your surgery and saying there's nothing to worry about versus there is, I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon. The other thing we did in this trial is to look at uh, angiogenesis markers, markers of making new blood vessels, because that's how bevacizumab worked. That wasn't helpful either. And that's looking at the protein. So that's now looking at, at the dishes that come out uh, in Christian's analogy. Um, so that's looking at the tumor. So the other thing that we did was to look at blood. Uh, much more interested in looking at blood because it's much easier to get. And you don't have to come to the hospital to give it to us um, because you, it can be taken locally. It can be sent to us in the post. Quite a lot of blood gets sent around that way. Uh, that works for some things, but not all tests. Um, uh, and we found a hint that vascular endothelial growth factor, which is one of the targets of bevacizumab, might be associated with outcome. We also found that this protein, lactate dehydrogenase, wasn't hugely helpful. So it's a slight surprise, because in more advanced melanoma, stage 4 melanoma, this is extremely important at telling us the chances of people benefiting from treatment and not. Um, so again, it shows another problem, which is that the context is everything. Just measuring something is fine, but the context in which it's measured matters in terms of its importance. I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. So that's just showing it graphically. Uh, and you've seen a lot of kaplan meier curves. I think the key thing here is the hazard ratio uh, crosses 1 in its confidence interval. And the p-value is greater than 0.05. And Cindy's told you all about that, so I don't need to, 
to, to tell you that that means that what we saw is as likely to is highly likely to be due to chance rather than beyond all reasonable doubt. So that's the approach that we take to measuring things in and around melanoma and using it to try and change our behavior in terms of how we look after people, how we make decisions about treatment, and so forth. Now, liquid biopsies are slightly different from this. The regular blood tests that we tend to do measure cells, like white blood cells, neutrophils, which are very important if you're on chemotherapy, um, platelets. They measure proteins, like lactate dehydrogenase. They measure iron salts. Uh, that tell us about kidney function. So they're all extremely important. But liquid biopsies, as they're being developed now, measure a whole bunch of other stuff. Exosomes, which are little extruded particles from cells, particularly cancer cells, bits of RNA, bits of DNA here, and the occasional tumor cell that gets out into the bloodstream. And the reason that we think that they're important and interesting, and I don't need to show you that because Christian's done that already, um, is that Essentially, that means that there's a part of the tumour that's getting into the bloodstream that we can look at, and from that, infer what the tumour's getting up to. Now, there's a real issue with this, which is we're not sure it truly reflects what's going on in the tumour, but is there something special about the cell here that then falls in to the bloodstream? Is there something different about it from the ones in the middle of the tumour that mean that what we learn is misleading? So we always have to consider that as we go through all of this. And just to prove that, that, that no idea is truly new, um, this was being done um, using much older technology uh, back in 1991 uh, by a chap called Peter Selby, who's the, then the professor in Leeds. And this Eric Blair, uh, for those of you who are literary inclined, is not George Orwell, who was dead by 1991. Um, but, so one of the first things that we we tried to do, I'm moving on now, in 1991 I was just qualifying for medical school, so nothing to do with me, um, is to look at melanoma cells in the blood. Now about 15 years ago there was lots of excitement about circulating tumour cells and they were found in breast cancer, in bowel cancer. It was shown that, that finding them told you that, that things weren't going to go well for your patient. Didn't tell us very much beyond that. Uh, now, we had to invent a different method for doing that for melanoma cells because the way in which you pull tumor cells out of the blood is to use magnetism. You would attach uh, antibodies with, with ferromagnetic particles that were specific for tumor cells. And the nice thing about melanoma is they've got nice proteins on the outside or bits of protein on the outside that are specific and not found in other cells in the blood. And then you use a magnet, and it's a posher magnet than that, um, to suck the cells out, and then you can study them. Uh, and, they, they, and you can put all sorts of dyes on them to see what they're getting up to and all the rest of it. And there's a picture of some of these cells from individuals. Now, the problem with this approach was that the vast majority of people with cancer, and this is melanoma data from patients in Oxford, don't have any cells in the blood with this method. It turns out this is a really, really rubbish method for pulling cells out of the blood that are quite rare. I mean, it's quite a hard task. We are talking about pulling one in a million to one in a billion cells out. Uh, but it turns out that it's still pretty rubbish. Um, but you do see a number of people with cells. And this is a logarithm. Well, it's not really a logarithmic scale, but it's certainly not a linear scale. Um, so the, the, the chap up here has got thousands of cells. Um, and you catch the occasional cell, which is slightly puzzling in people who don't have melanoma. Um, so our magnetism isn't quite as specific as we thought. Um, but it does translate into uh, the ability to say who's going to do rather badly. Um, because these are all my patients, I could also look at them when I took the blood. And this is probably about as useful as looking at the person you're taking the blood from at the time that you're taking the blood, in that these people here were all pretty sick at the time that they gave the blood. So you'll be unsurprised to hear that that's not made it into the clinic yet, and nobody's asking you for blood so that we can magnetize it and look for melanoma cells. So we're much more interested, really, in circulating tumor DNA. So as well as cells going into the blood, break down products of cells, and in particular, chopped up DNA, uh, ends up in the bloodstream. And this is probably where I think we're going to see practice change, but probably not for another five to ten years. So we know that there's a whole bunch of people here who have a mutation in BRAF, 
another group that have them in NRAS, and then there are other genes, NF1 here, that are well represented. Uh, so we can go looking for these. These are actually quite easy to measure in the blood. They're still pretty rare. They're still pretty uh, a small proportion of the DNA that's floating around in the blood. But as well as tumor DNA, you get free DNA from all the normal cells or some of the normal cells in your body. So we've got to find that needle in the haystack. But the nice thing about melanoma is because these mutations are specific to the tumor, we can go looking for them. Um, so we did this in the trial that I showed you. Because one of the questions that we we're interested in finding out is, well, all the people who went into the trial, by definition, had quite a high risk of the melanoma coming back. So could we see it at the molecular level at the time they went into the trial? And the reason we we're particularly interested in that time is everybody had a CT scan around that time, which showed nothing on it. So we, our, our gold standard, if you like, was negative at that time. The first thing I'd say is we... we Looked at about 160 patients. We found circulating tumor DNA for BRAF or NRAS. We only looked at those mutations by the most sensitive technique we have. And the, the problem with this sort of work is it's a minefield. Everybody's got a new test that's better than the last test. Uh, but by the time you've got it ready, it, there's a new test that's better than the last <coughs> test. And you can go around and around in circles. This is very robust technology. And one of the things we're interested in doing is inventing a, and using a test that everybody can do in every path lab up and down the country because that's what's useful for changing practice. So the blood had not been prepared in the ideal way to look at this, because when we collected it, we had no idea that this was going to be possible. So this is probably rather a low detection rate. But we found 19 patients in whom we could detect mutations that should only be found in melanoma cells. Uh, going around in their blood as free DNA. Um, those patients were, by and large, very similar to all the other patients that uh, were in the study, so we hadn't picked out a weird group of people. They seemed to be representative of all 1,300 people who went on the trial. And then if we found the circulating tumor DNA, it was much, much, much more likely that the melanoma was going to come back, and quickly. But if you look at these people, this is, this, is, uh, oh, I've lost this is one year here. So you've got about three quarters of them, their melanomas come back within the year. Uh, whereas it's only about a quarter of those patients um, who didn't have that. So the test is by no means specific. It doesn't identify everybody who's going to relapse. Um, but it... If it is positive, it's quite meaningful. Um, and that then translates into whether it's likely for people to survive their melanoma or not, as one might anticipate. So, so I think this is quite an exciting technology. Its one drawback is that you have to know what you're looking for. So you need to know whether BRAF or NRAS is in the tumor. And if you haven't got BRAF or NRAS, then you have to start finding, you know, cutting into ever smaller slices of different and rarer mutations in order to track it. So it has some limitations uh, to it. So one of the things that we're interested in is, first of all, refining this. Now, Matthew's going to talk about adjuvant treatment, so I'm going to be very careful about what I say and not steal his thunder. But let's assume that we move, up, move treatment on and we start to apply some of the treatments that we've talked about earlier today for people with high-risk melanoma as a means of preventing it from coming back after surgery. Well, the next question is going to be, well, what about the people with lower risk? As I said earlier, a huge number of people with lower-risk melanoma, uh, you know, form, they form the bulk of the people that we see with stage 4 melanoma in the end, because there's so many of them. So can we pick those people out and treat them with what increasingly looks like more and more effective drugs at an earlier stage to nip that in the bud. Now, we're never going to get that funded unless we've got something like this that absolutely picks them out at that point uh, and, and says, look, here's the problem. It's going to come back and quickly, so let's do something about it now rather than waiting for that. <laughs> so the other way in which we could get around this is to look for slightly different parameters in the blood that aren't specific to the mutations. And there's two ways in which we're exploring this in, uh, in collaboration with a group in Santander. Um, and 
so this looks at our circulating free RNA. So in the same way as you get circulating DNA, circulating bits of Christian's cookbook, you get circulating bits of recipe. I think I'm probably extending this metaphor further than it <laughs> can stand. But anyway, you get circulating bits of recipe around as well. And you can start to look at that. And I'm not going to bore you with the, the, the tedious bits of that. But you can tell the difference between somebody without melanoma and somebody with stage 1 or stage 2 or stage 3 or stage 4 disease um, by doing that. At the moment, we don't think we can do that reliably. Uh, so it's not a test that we're trying to roll out. But what will be interesting, obviously, is if we think we've got somebody with stage 1 who's got a stage 4 pattern as a means of telling us, here's somebody with microscopic disease. We can't see it on the CT scan, but trouble's just around the corner. Better start doing something about it now. Um, briefly, in the five minutes I've got left, um, the other thing we can use this for is to monitor people on treatment. And this is a patient of mine who had treatment initially with emirafenib, which he didn't tolerate very well. So you can see he had a bit, then he had a break, then he had another bit. And this is, his BRAF, this is all his mutations. So you can do this for lots and lots of mutations and essentially try and reconstruct the, the, the genome abnormalities in any given person. Um, and what you can see is that vemurafenib works. Boy, do all the mutations go down. So you, you've got rid of a large bulk of the tumor. But as is often the case, because we had to stop treatments, he couldn't tolerate it. It starts to come back. He had some epilimumab because this was a few years ago and nothing else. And then the tumor came back in spades, ultimately. For us, this is interesting because it allows us to track whether there are new mutations as well. So it could tell us why these treatments have not worked and shift treatment accordingly. But that's very much a research tool. But it, it shows you the potential of this sort of approach. The other thing that we can do uh, is, is to look at the immune cells. So like Christian, like a lot of other researchers, we're very interested in what goes on in the immune system and how this tells us who's going to benefit from IPI, who's going to benefit from NEVO, who's going to benefit from PEMBRO. And the way in which we've traditionally done that is to collect all the white blood cells up um, by spinning your blood around and, and pulling off a little layer called the Buffy coat. And then we put it in a machine called a, a cell sorter, uh, and which, which essentially divides the cells according to what's on their, on their outside. And then we can measure the population. Now we've got a fancy new piece of kit, uh, which allows us to do this in 34 different ways simultaneously um, and look at it in enormous detail. Uh, and this is roughly what the workflow is. And I think in my talk last year, which Nick Coop presented on my behalf, we showed you some pictures of some of the outputs of this, which is a sort of splodgergram of different T cells, uh, which the splodgergram is pretty, but actually it's the analysis that goes on behind it that tells us what's going. And this is actually a slide from Mitch Levesque at Zurich, who does this slightly better than us, um, very annoyingly. Um, but one of the things that we discovered in looking at this for the first time is that the biggest differences that we see aren't necessarily between the type of melanoma that a patient has, the stage it's at, or even the sort of response that happens to treatment, although we see some quite big differences with that. The biggest difference is between being a melanoma patient and not, because as well as bleeding patients, we bleed students and passing researchers and so forth so that we can compare things with normal. So that tells us, well, is this a way in? Because you know, the most sensitive instrument that we have, probably for detecting bad stuff in our bodies, is our immune system. So can we mine this information rather than looking at fragments of DNA? Because we could do that in a way that doesn't require us to know what's going on inside your melanoma cell. So that's one of the ways in which you take it at the moment. Hopefully, the other approach will work better because it's much simpler and cheaper. Because, I mean, this is horrendously expensive at the moment. And, even though things get cheaper over time, it's also very, very labor intensive. So it's not scalable at the moment. But it's the other way in which we're, we're, we're approaching it. So I think that we've got the tools now to track things like DNA and RNA over time. And because we can do that from blood, we could do that once a month or once a week if we really wanted to. The really exciting stuff is companies like Nanopore that, that can give you a test on a stick so that you could almost do a pregnancy test type thing. 
So two bars bad, one bar good, but I, I think that might be psychologically quite tricky. Uh, and that is one of the things that, that, that I think is very important about this sort of testing regime. We saw a lot of publicity around grail and blood tests to find out who might have cancer in the general population. With all of these sorts of tests, it, we could use them at home, ultimately, and put the power in your hands. But then the question has to be, well, how will we manage that? Because that's such a radical shift in how we deliver health care. You know, how can we support you to do that? How do we not screw with people's heads and give them a mental illness uh, as we give them control of their melanoma? Because they're living with a stress and somebody's there you know, doing a blood test five times a day. You know, have I got my beer off back? Have I got my... So I think there's, there's a massive public health and, and education and positioning issue to be done if we can make all this work. But I think what it, it is exciting in the sense that it puts control of melanoma back with patients, back with local physicians in a way that is systematic, that is measurably accurate in a way that, you know, people like me aren't. You know, some of us are experts, some of us are probably slightly less expert than we think we are. Um, many of us are, are, are not expert at all of the bits and pieces um, that are required in, in looking for, for melanoma relapse in particular. Uh, so don't expect your oncologist or your dermatologist to offer this to you next week, but I think blood-borne monitoring of melanoma is probably coming sometime in the next decade. <laughs>